This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Dennis Sayers in Modesto, California, winter 2006. Robinson Crusoe by Daniel Defoe Chapter 7 Agricultural Experience I had now been in this unhappy island above ten months. All possibility of deliverance from this condition seemed to be entirely taken from me, and I firmly believed that no human shape had ever set foot upon that place. Having now secured my habitation, as I thought, fully to my mind, I had a great desire to make a more perfect discovery of the island, and to see what other productions I might find, which I yet knew nothing of. It was on the 15th of July that I began to take a more particular survey of the island itself. I went up the creek first, where, as I hinted, I brought my rafts on shore. I found, after I came about two miles up, that the tide did not flow any higher, and that it was no more than a little brook of running water, very fresh and good. But this being the dry season, there was hardly any water in some parts of it, at least not enough to run in any stream. So, as it could be perceived, on the banks of this brook, I found many pleasant savannas or meadows, plain, smooth, and covered with grass, and on the rising parts of them, next to the higher grounds, where the water, as might be supposed, never overflowed, I found a great deal of tobacco, green, and growing to a great and very strong stalk. There were divers other plants, which I had no notion of, or understanding about, that might perhaps have virtues of their own, which I could not find out. I searched for the cassava root, which the Indians in all that climate make their bread of, but I could find none. I saw large plants of aloes, but did not understand them. I saw several sugar canes, but wild and for want of cultivation imperfect. I contented myself with these discoveries for this time, and came back, musing with myself what course I might take to know the virtue and goodness of any of the fruits or plants which I should discover, but could bring it to no conclusion, for, in short, I had made so little observation while I was in the Brazils that I knew little of the plants in the field, at least very little that might serve to any purpose now in my distress. The next day, the 16th, I went up the same way again, and after going somewhat further than I had gone the day before, I found the brook and the savannas cease, and the country become more woody than before. In this part I found different fruits, and particularly I found melons upon the ground, in great abundance, and grapes upon the trees. The vines had spread, indeed, over the trees, and the clusters of grapes were just now in their prime, very ripe and rich. This was a surprising discovery, and I was exceeding glad of them, but I was warned by my experience to eat sparingly of them, remembering that when I was ashore in Barbary, the eating of grapes killed several of our Englishmen, who were slaves there, by throwing them into fluxes and fevers. But I found an excellent use for these grapes, and that was to cure or dry them in the sun, and keep them as dried grapes or raisins are kept, which I thought would be, as indeed they were, wholesome and agreeable to eat when no grapes could be had. I spent all that evening there, and went back to my habitation, which, by the way, was the first night, as I might say, I had lain from home. In the night I took my first contrivance, 
and got up in a tree where I slept well, and the next morning proceeded upon my discovery, traveling, traveling nearly four miles, as I might judge by the length of the valley, keeping still due, due north, with a ridge of hills on the south and north side of me. At the end of this march I came to an opening where the country seemed to descend to the west, and a little spring of fresh water, which issued out of the side of the hill by me, ran the other way, that is, due east, and the country appeared so fresh, so green, so flourishing, everything being in a constant verdure or flourish of spring, that it looked like a planted garden. I descended a little on the side of that delicious vale, surveying it with a secret kind of pleasure, though mixed with my other afflicting thoughts, to think that this was all my own, <laughs> that I was king and lord of all this country indefensibly, and had a right of possession, and if I could convey it, I might have it in inheritance, as completely as any lord of a manor in England. I saw here abundance of cocoa trees, orange and lemon and citron trees, but all wild, and very few bearing any fruit, at least not then. However, the green limes that I gathered were not only pleasant to eat, but very wholesome, and I mixed their juice afterwards with water, and made it very wholesome, and very cool and refreshing. I found now I had business enough to gather and carry home, and I resolved to lay up a store as well of grapes as limes and lemons to furnish myself for the wet season, which I knew was approaching. In order to do this, I gathered a great heap of grapes in one place, a lesser heap in another place, and a great parcel of limes and lemons in another place, and taking a few of each with me, I traveled homewards, resolving to come again and bring a bag or a sack, or what I can make, to carry the rest home. Accordingly, having spent three days in this journey, I came home, so I must now call my tent and my cave my home, but before I got thither, the grapes were spoiled, the richness of the fruit and the weight of the juice having broken them and bruised them. They were good for little or nothing. As to the limes, they were good, but I could bring but a few. The next day, being the 19th, I went back, having made me two small bags to bring home my harvest, but I was surprised when coming to my heap of grapes, which were so rich and fine when I gathered them, to find them all spread about, trod to pieces, and dragged about, some here, some there, and abundance eaten and devoured. By this I concluded there were some wild creatures thereabouts, which had done this, but what they were I knew not. However, as I found there was no laying them up on heaps, and no carrying them away in a sack, but that one way they would be destroyed, and the other way they would be crushed with their own weight, I took another course, for I gathered a large quantity of the grapes and hung them trees that they might cure and dry in the sun. And as for the limes and lemons, I carried as many back as I could well stand under. When I came home from this journey, I contemplated with great pleasure the fruitfulness of that valley and the pleasantness of the situation, the security from storms on that side of the water and the wood, and concluded that I had pitched upon a place to fix my abode, which was by far the worst part of the country. Upon the whole, I began to consider of removing my habitation, and looking out for a place equally safe as where now I was situate, if possible, in that pleasant, fruitful part of the island. 
This thought ran long in my head, and I was exceedingly fond of it for some time, the pleasantness of the place tempting me, but when I came to a nearer view of it, I considered that I was now by the seaside, where it was at least possible that something might happen to my advantage, and by the same ill fate that brought me hither, might bring some other unhappy wretches to the same place, and though it was scarce probable that any such thing should ever happen, yet to enclose myself among the hills and woods in the centre of the island was to anticipate my bondage, and to render such an affair not only improbable, but impossible, and that therefore I ought not by any means to remove. However, I was so enamoured of this place that I spent much of my time there for the whole of the remaining part of the month of July, and though upon second thoughts I resolved not to move, yet I built me a little kind of a bower, and surrounded it at a distance with strong fence, being a double hedge, as high as I could reach, well staked and filled between with brushwood, and here I lay very secure sometimes two or three nights together, always going over it with a ladder, so that I fancy now I had my country house and my sea-coast house, and this work took me up to the beginning of August. I had but newly finished my fence, and begun to enjoy my labor, when the rains came on and made me stick close to my first habitation, for though I had made me a tent like the other, with a piece of sail, and spread it very well, yet I had not the shelter of a hill to keep me from storms, nor a cave behind me to retreat into when the rains were extraordinary. About the beginning of August, as I said, I had finished my bower, and began to enjoy myself. The third of August I found the grapes I had hung up perfectly dried, and indeed, were excellent good raisins of the sun. So I began to take them down from the trees, and it was very happy that I did so, for the rains which followed would have spoiled them. And I had lost the best part of my winter food, for I had above two hundred large bunches of them. No sooner had I taken them down and carried the most of them home to my cave, and then it began to rain, and from hence which was the 14th of August, it rained more or less every day till the middle of October, and sometimes so violently that I could not stir out of my cave for several days. In this season I was much surprised with the increase of my family. I had been concerned for the loss of one of my cats, who ran away from me, or, as I thought, had been dead, and I heard no more tidings of her till, to my astonishment, she came home, about the end of August, with three kittens. This was the more strange to me, because, though I had killed a wild cat, as I called it, with my gun, yet I thought it was quite a different kind from our European cats, but the young cats were the same kind of house-breed as the old one, and both my cats, being females, I thought it very strange. But from these three cats I afterwards came to be so pestered, with cats, that I was forced to kill them like vermin or wild beasts, and to drive them from my house as much as possible. From the 14th of August to the 26th, incessant rain, so that I could not stir, and was now very thankful not to be much wet. In this confinement I began to be straitened for food, but venturing out twice, I one day killed a goat, and the last day, which was the 26th, found a very large tortoise, which was a treat to me, and my food was regulated thus. I ate a bunch of raisins for my breakfast, a piece of the goat's flesh, or of the turtle, for my dinner, broiled, for to my great misfortune I had no vessel to boil or stew anything, and two or three of the turtle's eggs for my supper. During this confinement in my cover by the rain, I worked daily two or three hours at enlarging my cave, and by degrees worked it on towards one side till I 
came to the outside of the hill and made a door or way out which came beyond my fence or wall and so i came in and out this way but i was not perfectly easy at lying so open for as i had managed myself before i was in a perfect enclosure whereas now i thought i lay exposed and open for anything to come in upon me and yet i could not perceive that there was any living thing to fear the biggest creature that i had yet seen upon the island being a goat september thirtieth i was now come to the unhappy anniversary of my landing i cast up the notches on my post and found i had been on shore three hundred and sixty-five days i kept this day as a solemn fast setting it apart for religious exercise prostrating myself on the ground with the most serious humiliation confessing my sins to god acknowledging his righteous judgments upon me and praying to him to have mercy on me through jesus christ and not having tasted the least refreshment for twelve hours even till the going down of the sun i then ate a biscuit cake and a bunch of grapes and went to bed finishing the day as i began it i had all this time observed no sabbath day for as at first i had no sense of religion upon my mind i had after some time omitted to distinguish the weeks by making a longer notch than ordinary for the sabbath day and so did not really know what any of the days were but now having cast up the days as above i found i had been there a year so i divided it into weeks and set apart every seventh day for a sabbath though i found at the end of my account i had lost a day or two in my reckoning a little after this my ink began to fail me and so i contented myself to use it more sparingly and to write down only the most memorable events of my life without continuing a daily memorandum of other things the rainy season and the dry season began now to appear regular to me and i learned to divide them to provide for them accordingly but i bought all my experience before i had it and this i am going to relate was one of the most discouraging experiments that i made i have mentioned that i had saved the few ears of barley and rice which i had so surprisingly found spring up as i thought of themselves and i believe there were about thirty stalks of rice and about twelve of barley and now i thought it a proper time to sow it after the rains the sun being in its southern position going from me accordingly i dug up a piece of ground as well as i could with my wooden spade and dividing it into two parts i sowed my grain but as i was sowing it casually occurred to my thoughts that i would not sow it all at first because i did not know what was the proper time for it so i sowed about two-thirds of the seed and leaving about a handful of each it was a great comfort to me afterwards that i did so for not one grain of what i sowed this time came to anything for the dry months following the earth having had no rain after the seed was sown it had little moisture to assist its growth and never came up at all till the wet season had come again and then it grew as much as if it had been but newly sown finding my first seed did not grow which i easily imagined was by the drought i sought out for a moister piece of ground to make another trial and i dug up a piece of ground near my new bower and sowed the rest of my seed in february a little before the vernal equinox and this having the rainy months of march and april to water it sprung up very pleasantly and yielded a very good crop and having part of the seed left only and not daring to sow all that i had i had but a small quantity at last my whole crop not amounting to above half a peck of each kind but by this experiment i was made master of my business and knew exactly when the proper season was to sow and that i might expect 
two seed times and two harvests every year. While this corn was growing, I made a little discovery, which was of use to me afterwards. As soon as the rains were over, and the weather began to settle, which was about the month of November, I made a visit up the country to my bower, where, though I had not been some months, yet I found all things just as I left them. The circle or double hedge that I had made was not only firm and entire, but the stakes which I had cut out of some trees that grew thereabouts were all shot out and grown with long branches, as much as a willow tree usually shoots the first year after lopping its head. I could not tell what tree to call it that these stakes were cut from. I was surprised and yet well pleased to see the young trees grow, and I pruned them and led them to up to grow as much alike as I could, and it is scarce credible how beautiful a figure they grew into in three years, so that though the hedge made a circle of about twenty-five yards in diameter, yet the trees, for such as I might now call them, soon covered it, and it was a complete shade, sufficient to lodge under all the dry season. This made me resolve to cut some more stakes, and make me a hedge like this, in a semicircle round my wall, I mean that of my first dwelling, which I did, and placing the trees or stakes in a double row, at about eight yards distance from my first fence, they grew presently, and were at first a fine cover to my habitation, and afterwards served for a defense also, as I shall observe in its order. I found now that the seasons of the year might generally be divided, not into summer and winter as in Europe, but into the rainy seasons and the dry seasons, which were generally thus, the half of February, the whole of March, and the half of April, rainy, the sun being then on or near the equinox, the half of April, the whole of May, June, and July, and the half of August, dry, the sun being then to the north of the line, the half of August, the whole of September, and the half of October, rainy, the sun being then come back, the half of October, the whole of November, December, and January, and the half of February, dry, the sun being then to the south of the line. The rainy seasons sometimes held longer or shorter as the winds happened to blow, but this was the general observation I made, after I had found my ex by experience the ill consequences of being abroad in the rain, I took care to furnish myself with provisions beforehand, that I might not be obliged to go out, and I sat within doors as much as possible during the wet months. This time I found much employment, and very suitable also to the time, for I found great occasion for many things which I had no way to furnish myself with, but by hard labor and constant application. Particularly, I tried many ways to make myself a basket, but all the twigs I could get for the purpose proved so brittle that they would do nothing. It proved of excellent advantage to me now, that when I was a boy, I used to take great delight in standing at a basket maker's in the town where my father lived to see them make their wicker ware, and being, as boys usually are, very officious to help, and a great observer of the manner in which they work these things, and sometimes lending a hand, I had by these means full knowledge of the methods of it, and I wanted nothing but the materials, when it came into my mind that the twigs of that tree from whence I cut my stakes that grew might possibly be as tough as the sallows, willows, and osiers in England, and I resolved to try. Accordingly, the next day I went to my country house, as I called it, and Cutting down some of the smaller twigs, I found them to my purpose as much as I could desire. Whereupon I came the next time, prepared with a hatchet to cut down a quantity, 
which I soon found, for there was a great plenty of them. These I set up to dry within my circle or hedge, and when they were fit for use I carried them to my cave, and here, during the next season, I employed myself in making, as well as I could, a great many baskets, both to carry earth, or to carry or lay up anything, as I had occasion. And though I did not finish them very handsomely, yet I made them sufficiently serviceable for my purpose. Thus, afterwards, I took care never to be without them, and as my wickerware decayed, I made more, especially strong, deep baskets to place my corn in, instead of sacks, when I should come to have any quantity of it. Having mastered this difficulty, and employed a world of time about it, I bestirred myself to see, if possible, how to supply two wants. I had no vessels to hold anything that was liquid, except two runlets, which were almost full of rum, and some glass bottles, some of the common size, and others which were case bottles, square for the holding of water, spirits, etc. I had not so much as a pot to boil anything, except a great kettle, which I saved out of the ship, and which was too big for such as I desired it, that is, to make broth and stew a bit of meat by itself. The second thing I fain would have had was a tobacco pipe, but it was impossible to make me one. However, I found a contrivance for that too, at last. I employed myself in planting my second rows of stakes or piles, and in this wicker working all the summer or dry season, when another business took me up more time than it could be imagined I could spare. End of chapter 7